Well, I'll, I'll crack on then because um, it is a bit of a whistle stop tour tonight. Um, and we're really going to be looking at the main groups of psychiatric medication uh, that you likely have come across in, in practice. You know, I think regardless of your professional group, where you work in, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to come across someone who's on one of these medications. Um, so just, you know, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Stephen Marks. I'm sure some of you might have seen me present before. Um, got a little bit of a series going with CPD Me. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in mental health nursing at MMU, and I'm also a qualified um, ACP, an independent prescriber. Um, and I think this is kind of what I was saying here. Just I think as we go through this, have a little think about your role, where you're working, what kind of patient group that you are kind of. Uh, looking after, you know, it might well be that if you are a prescriber yourself, you might be prescribing psychotropics in primary care, or you might be using rapid tranquilization in acute hospital settings. Um, so this should hopefully give you a quite broad overview of all the various types of psychiatric medication. Um, we're going to start by exploring antidepressants. Um, this is a bit of an overview. Um, I think most people, you've probably heard of the term SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, and you may well be familiar with some of these drugs here, um, sertraline, citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine and paroxetine. These are all fairly commonly prescribed um, kind of frontline treatment for depression. Um, We've also got SNRIs. So again, you may have come across venlafaxine, duloxetine. Uh, going to some more, I guess, what we would consider now as old, old-fashioned um, antidepressants, amitriptyline, trazodone. Um, a lot of people may well have come across amitriptyline as a, a, sort of a pain medication. Um, I think GPs quite like that for neuropathic pain. Um, so again, it's always good to query why someone's on it because it might not actually be for depression. Um, it might be for, for pain that they're experiencing. Um, you don't tend to see tricyclics prescribed these days as a frontline treatment for depression. Um, I think we're more going to see this in the context of people that have been on it for many years, probably older people, uh, maybe when that depression was quite difficult to treat when they were younger um, and a decision has been made kind of not to rock the boat with the treatment pathway if that's what was working for them. Um, we've got a class um, of its own that you'll rarely see prescribed now, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, you know, these were one of the first kind of major groups of antidepressants. Um, but a lot have now been withdrawn from the market. And I think the reason for that is that they are, you know, they're not especially nice drugs. They're quite lethal in overdose. Um, they came with all sorts of conditions. You know, these were drugs that patients couldn't have grapefruit juice, cheese without having horrific reactions. Um, so I think it's just got to a point now that there's the, the benefits of them um, are completely outweighed by all the risks of the medication. Again, I think as time goes on, we will see less and less of these on prescription cards, but you may well see them as legacy drugs um, that they've not been able to kind of phase out. And then in a little sort of class of its own, uh, we've got a drug called metazapine, uh, which is considered a noradrenaline and specific serotonergic antidepressant. Um, that's in a bit of uh, its own category there. Um, again, it's something you may well have come across. One of the unique features of metazapine um, is that it's often prescribed at night whereas most other ones are prescribed in the daytime. The reason for that, it's got a bit of a sedative effect without being a kind of true hypnotic. And it's also a drug that's used to stimulate appetite. Now, what you find sometimes is that people with depression um, can experience insomnia. They can experience kind of problems with appetite. So I think it was quite fashionable for a while for metazapine to be used for people with those sub-symptoms um, of depression. I think selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is probably the category that are most commonly prescribed. Um, we will have a little look at the nice guidelines and look at the kind of prescribing guidelines around these. Um, but these are the ones that NICE recommend as your frontline treatment 
for a variety of reasons, you know, to do with effectiveness for most people. They're generally kind of safe for most people in terms of their effect on the heart. Uh, cost effectiveness as well certainly factors into that. You know, for most people with depression, they're going to work most of the time. Um, and how they work, they kind of work by increasing the amount of serotonin that's available in the brain um, at any given time. Now, serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It helps regulate mood, memory, pleasure, sleeping, eating, learning, right down to kind of cell communication. Uh, and this class of drug is also licensed for anxiety and OCD. So you may well see people on an SSRI. Doesn't always necessarily mean that that is for depression. Um, so worth getting a good history um, if you're ever reviewing anyone's medication. A little bit um, complex here, but I think this shows, you know, I think when we hear terms like SSRI, it sounds a bit complex. But I actually think if you take each word and break down what's happening, um, it actually shows quite clearly what's happening kind of at the brain. So most of our psychotropic medications, probably all of them actually, are having their effect in the brain because they are changing our neurotransmitters. And the point of the SSRI is to make more serotonin available. Um, and how it does that is that it kind of blocks the reabsorption of serotonin. Now, it's a bit of an ongoing theory. You know, we've kind of got rid of the chemical imbalance theory. We know that depression is much more complicated than that. But we also know that serotonin does play an important role in mood regulation. So the idea is that these new neurotransmitters are naturally recycled within the brain. So what we want to do is slow down that recycling process to make more serotonin av available in the synapse. So a way of thinking about that or visualizing that, if you imagine a pump that's sucking out toxins from, from a pool, you still want that to be coming out. You still want some of it to be recycled, but you want to maybe switch off a couple of them so that that rate is ultimately slowed down and there's more available in the synapse. Um, your, your, your other class of drug is your selective serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. Now, these are typically in the UK. You're working with venlafaxine and duloxetine. Um, they're a little bit newer than SSRIs, and they're generally felt to be stronger. Um, I think the guidelines and kind of prescribing practice tends to be that you would go for an SNRI if someone hasn't responded appropriately or in the way that we would have liked to an SSRI. Now, they, they are pretty good. They tend to work. They tend to treat the depression pretty well. But the trade-off of that is that the side effects can be a bit stronger um, and the drugs are certainly more dangerous uh, if used in overdose. Um, venlafaxine, for example, very dangerous uh, on the heart. Um, and even when not taking an overdose, you have to monitor someone's cardiac health pretty closely uh, when they're on vent venlafaxin. So that's the kind of trade-off. And we'll have a think about um, implications with other substances, in overdose, um, other psychotropic medications. So, you know, think about the patients that you may have worked with and think about, you know, have they reported any of the following? And it can actually be quite tricky to, to actually pin these down as side effects because they're so common in other illnesses as symptoms of just generally being unwell. Um, but these are the ones that are kind of most common uh, when we are prescribing antidepressants. So agitation, feeling shaky, anxious, um, feeling and being sick. You know, we know that the start of serotonin production is in the tummy. And I think initially people can feel a little bit overwhelmed when it's getting kicked into overdrive. Um, so stomach problems aren't that uh, uncommon in people with sort of depression and on antidepressants. Again, because they are quite stimulating drugs um, that can sometimes cause diarrhea, can sometimes cause loss of appetite, dizziness, you know, anything that's working on your central nervous system, these are quite powerful drugs. Because of the stimulating effect, you know, they can cause insomnia. Um, and on the flip side, they can also cause people to feel a little bit sleepy as well. Headaches. 
Um, one of the most kind of common symptoms that I think as healthcare practitioners were not very good at talking about is kind of sexual function. You know, SSRIs are notorious for impacting on loss of libido, um, ability to achieve orgasm um, and difficulty kind of uh, obtaining or maintaining an erection. And I think it's a bit of a research interest of mine that we actually get better at having these delicate conversations and actually guiding these conversations because overwhelmingly, when you speak to patients about it, it's something that they're absolutely desperate to get off their chest. They want to talk about it. Sex is an important part of, you know, human function, enjoying it, experiencing it with other people. Yet sometimes the drugs that we're prescribing can actually be a barrier to that quite important part of someone's life. So <laughs> when should antidepressants be prescribed? This is a lot of debate around this. Um, what I've included, I think these slides will be shared with you later, is a link to the NICE guidelines um, on the management of depression. They've actually been updated uh, last summer in June 2020. And the, the purpose of that update really was to try and simplify what was a quite complicated diagnostic process. So really, they've split it down the middle. Um, and depression is now categorized as less severe and more severe. Previously, uh, we would talk about mild, moderate, severe depression, and there was all kind of different screening tools to help get you to that conclusion. Um, but I think there's very much a push now to reduce antidepressant prescribing, um, certainly in milder cases of depression. Um, and really we want to avoid medication if possible, um, really unless someone's quite impaired by their symptoms of depression. Now, some of the common screening tools that you might have come across, the PHQ-9, um, that's Public Health Questionnaire 9, I believe, um, and that is one that helps uh, ascertain if someone is depressed. Uh, the GAD-7, on the other hand, is a really good screening tool for working out if someone is anxious. Um, and you've also got the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, uh, which is one I use quite a lot in practice. I worked in liaison psychiatry, and that's quite a sensitive tool for helping you to work, work out if an inpatient in hospital, are they depressed or are they just fed up because being in hospital is not an especially nice experience? You know, are they just sick of NHS food? You know, are they lonely? That kind of thing. So it's really, really quite interesting tool. Um, anyone that does work in a hospital setting, you might want to get yourself familiar with that as a screening tool because it can be really helpful. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, the, our understanding of depression is constantly evolving. It's no longer just seen as a chemical imbalance on its own. Uh, we understand there are genetic components. There's certainly psychological components. Um, people reacting to their environment, stressors, things that have happened in childhood. So I think the purpose of kind of a medication review or a prescription really should be to target symptoms of depression that can't be addressed through other means. So to put that into some kind of context, this is the guidance for less severe depression. And if we start at guided self-help, this is categorized in a way uh, it's kind of recommended based on the committee's interpretation of clinical and cost effectiveness. So, you know, for, for mild depression or less severe depression, guided self-help is pretty accessible by a lot of people. It's not got a huge impact on staff. Um, and if you look, SSRI antidepressants are quite low down that list. You know, if you follow it clockwise, um, it's the third most effective or third least recommended intervention here. Now, this varies uh, quite drastically when we contrast this to severe depression. Uh, so the gold standard for this would be individual CBT in combination with antidepressant. And it's felt that that's the best way to treat more severe depression because it's working on the kind of the serotonin it's giving people that kind of that boost but it's also giving them skills through cbt to start addressing some of the unhelpful thoughts and behaviors that can keep someone in a bit of a depression spiral um, and you can see here that kind of antidepressant medication on its own a lot higher up the list um, but actually you know if someone isn't going to opt for the joint uh 
drug treatment and therapy, um, it certainly felt that you know, individual cognitive behavioural therapy can be more effective, especially if that person is a bit reluctant to try medication, um, or maybe because their issues are more rooted in social problems or relational problems that a medication isn't necessarily uh, going to fix. And as a prescriber, that was something I was very conscious of. You know, if someone came to me and they were having money problems, relationship problems, housing problems, it always felt far more appropriate to signpost them, make referrals to things that would help with those very practical things. And then if they remain depressed, once you kind of put that support in place, then that might give you an indication, OK, let's try an antidepressant now. There's perhaps more of a biological basis here. Um, but I think where possible, we should always be supporting people to address the things that are causing them the most bother. Um, I think another reason that kind of history taking, again, depending on what area you're practicing in, you might be someone who a person presents maybe with kind of vague mental health symptoms. The reason that it's really important to screen uh, for these things is that a lot of things that can present in depression can also be a sign of, of other issues. So, for example, if someone presents with low libido, or erectile dysfunction. Yes, that can be a symptom of depression, but it can also be associated with, you know, high cholesterol, hormone issues, thyroid problems, uh, vitamin D deficiency, quite a common, common thing that happens that makes people feel as if they are depressed. So I think it's important to do a really good screening to make sure that we're not going down the route um, prescribing SSRIs for what is actually a physical health problem. You know, thyroid issues, for example, um, hypothyroidism um, presents very much like depression. You know, people pretend, present as quite withdrawn, quite fatigued, exhausted all the time, a bit flat, but that's very much a hormonal thing. I think the point about that is that if you miss that diagnosis, you miss the opportunity to prescribe thyroxine rather than an antidepressant. You know, that person's thyroid issues aren't going to get better if we've got them stuck on an SSRI. So really important that we look at the kind of differential diagnoses here. One of the things I wanted to talk about, because this could happen to someone that you are looking after. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, but serotonin syndrome is a rare but potentially very dangerous uh, kind of medical condition. And it effectively happens when there's too much serotonin in the brain. And as we've, as we've established, you know, SSRIs, SNRIs, a lot of these psychiatric drugs work by creating more serotonin. Um, so, you know, an SSRI on its own is very unlikely to cause serotonin syndrome. But I think part of what I want to get across in this lecture is some of the other common substances that can also create serotonin, which would then put someone at increased risk. And again, these are some of the kind of the signs and symptoms, which again, quite difficult to make that diagnosis. This is why your history taking is so important, because all of these symptoms really uh, could be a sign of something else. And indeed, as we've already established, some of these signs and symptoms are also side effects of antidepressants themselves. <laughs> so some of the other factors um, that put someone at risk of serotonin syndrome, um, overdose, intentional overdose of psychiatric medication, um, that can certainly cause serotonin syndrome, uh, but so can other medication interactions. Um, picture on the right here, don't know if anyone's familiar with that or what I'm kind of getting at here, but the picture on the right is actually St. John's Wort. Now, people, if you're not familiar with that, it's sold over the counter, it's a herb, herbal remedy, it's been used for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, um, and it's generally felt to work pretty well um, in people with milder forms of depression. But it is notorious, not just in mental health drugs, but it's notorious for its interaction with a lot of other medications. Um, and so someone on St. John's Wort 
Maybe they don't disclose that. Maybe we don't ask about over-the-counter things before making a prescription. You know, that interaction, that drug interaction, could put someone at increased risk of serotonin syndrome. Um, recreational drugs as well, you know, especially ones that are stimulant-based. So you think about cocaine, MDMA, ecstasy. All of these make fe- fe- make people feel good by releasing a boatload of serotonin and dopamine. So again, that's something that could potentially be putting someone um, at risk. And while you might not be that healthcare professional that's making that prescription of an antidepressant, I think it's just really good practice to check in with people that you've got a therapeutic relationship with about any new or emerging drug use so that they can make informed decisions about their care and treatment. You know, at the, the, the worst end of the more severe end of serotonin syndrome, um, this is where it gets a bit more life threatening. So, you know, someone presenting with a high fever, tremor, seizures, a regular heartbeat, you know, that will eventually lead to unconsciousness and if not treated, uh, can lead to death. So, you know, if you're ever caring for someone and you notice that they're on a lot of things or maybe you know that they've got a drug history and they present like that, you know, I think if in doubt, you know, you'd get really 999 for that because you need to get someone to hospital to reverse the serotonin syndrome. Um, And again, you know, just to emphasize the point really when it comes to recreational drug use and over the counter, um, I think we need to be asking that before we make a prescription. Um, But also follow up, um, you know, on a regular basis, because a lot of people don't perhaps identify as drug users. This is the point I'm making my my next slide. You know, I think we maybe have an image in ourselves of someone that might be labelled a kind of chronic, harmful drug user. Um, And they may well identify as uh, that way as well, especially if they're under kind of drug and alcohol services. But if you take a different patient profile, this might be someone who occasionally takes MDMA at a festival or cocaine at a house party after a night out. These are people who might not necessarily identify as drug users in their heads. They might not self-label. But actually, these people are maybe at more risk of developing serotonin syndrome if they are prescribed um, an antidepressant. So that's why it's really important that we check in with people about their drug use asking in a kind of non-judgmental way about substances that they might be taking, whether that's recreational. Um, I think the word illegal can um, be misleading. You know, you you might want to ask about illegal drugs, but it's important to remember as well, there are a lot of drugs that people take recreationally might not necessarily be illegal, but they might be non-prescribed. You know, if you think about your opiates, that kind of thing. So it's it's about the language that we use when asking about the questions in order to get an accurate answer. I hope that makes sense. And I think, again, you know, it's about helping our patients to make informed choices about what they're putting in their body, what the risks are, what some of the potential complications are. Um, just a sort of brief note on other potential interactions. Um, so drugs like marijuana, really terrible for people that experience psychosis. That can really exacerbate uh, signs and symptoms of psychosis, and it can actually stop antipsychotics from working. So sort of the mechanisms of those two substances um, are at odds with each other. Um, it's quite well established that alcohol negates the benefits of antidepressants. So if someone is a really heavy drinker uh, with depression, there's very little point in starting that antidepressant until we get the substance misuse um, under control. And the the term we use for that is uh, dual diagnosis. Um, And that's when people have substance misuse problems and mental health problems. And these are quite a vulnerable client group. You know, these are the patients that typically slip through the cracks because services bat them back and forth. You know, you, you'll often get mental health services saying, right, treat the alcohol issues first. Alcohol services maybe say this person's too risky. We need mental health. Um, and I think, you know, especially now, we're all acutely aware of the pressures that the NHS is facing it's getting a little bit harder at the minute, you know, to get coordinated care, but that really is the best approach uh, to get the best outcomes for this really quite complex client group. 
Um, it may well be worth, you know, depending on where you're working, where you're practicing, have a little look. If your local area is particularly well resourced, um, there's every chance that they might have a dedicated dual diagnosis service. Uh, so that might be something that you can refer into if you are worried about someone. Um, but I think, you know, a good way to get your head around what services are out there is to Google, you know, mental health services, local area, and that will usually bring up a trust directory. A lot of these kind of mental health trusts will have a single point of access service where you can ask queries um, and maybe get some advice. Um, but I think it is good to familiar yourself with things that are out there, you know, almost before you need to refer, uh, before things become origin or, or, or an emergency. So we're going to move on now to speak about antipsychotics. And I guess just a note about this before we go on, I think it's very hard to talk about antipsychotics without talking about psychosis. Um, and it's just not possible to go into that in great detail. You know, some of you might not be overly familiar or overly comfortable with what psychosis is. Um, I don't remember the exact date. We can maybe check that at the end, but there is a separate lecture I'll be doing later in the year on psychosis. So while these lectures and seminars are very much standalone, they are designed to work well with other ones that I'm delivering. So I guess what I'm saying is that, yes, we'll be talking about antipsychotics. Don't worry so much if you are not too familiar with psychosis, uh, but certainly do tune in and it might well complement the information that you're getting in this one. But really, antipsychotics are used to treat what we call the positive symptoms of psychosis. And this is the experience, that, the experiences that are above and beyond the normal human experience. So you're probably familiar with hallucinations. Uh, definition of that is a kind of a perception of a stimulus that doesn't actually exist. <clears throat> and I think an important distinction to make is that, you know, for people who experience hallucinations, they are very, very real. They are experienced as if it is real. They are as real as my voice that you can hear right now. It's very different to a kind of internal monologue or thought process. Um, and we will unpick those symptoms um, in a future seminar. But the whole point of antipsychotics really um, is to address dopamine. So the, the main hypothesis, the hypothesis uh, that we've got about psychosis and positive symptoms is that they are caused by excess dopamine in the brain. So antipsychotics work by really reducing that dopamine. Now, dopamine is super, super important. You know, it's absolutely essential for heart function, cell communication, neurotransmitter, you know, just the body working well needs dopamine. It's also the neurotransmitter of reward. So if you can think of anything that feels good, sex, food, gambling, drugs, exercise, being in love, all of these things give you that dopamine high. And this is why dopamine is so kind of tied up in addiction. I think when people take kind of substances to give them that high, it's a kind of law of diminishing returns. And you're probably familiar with the phenomenon of people having to take more and more drugs to get the same effect. And dopamine, it's very much got its roots in of an evolutionary basis. You know, before we had the luxury of being able to loop things up or medical science, you know, Mother Nature had to tell us, um, you know, our own bodies had to tell us to do things that were important for the survival of the species. You know, that's why sex feels so good. It's because we want to make more of ourselves. And again, you know, back when we were hunter-gatherers, fatty food, eating that would have that real dopamine high because your body would want you to store that fat because it would help you to survive. So all of this is, you know, it's, it's kind of really key to enjoying life. It's key to enjoying love, friendship, etc., hobbies, motivation, goal-directed behavior. Um, we'll come back to kind of some of my points about that, but I think what I'm going to get at in a little minute is that when we start to pump people full of drugs that bring down that dopamine, that really explains why the side effect profile of these drugs is really quite horrendous uh, for a lot of people, at least until they've got, got used to that drug, because you're really taking away a neurotransmitter that's so key uh, for functioning in day-to-day -day life. 
Now, again, this is a very long list. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry, don't feel intimidated by this. It's just to give you an idea of just the vast range of antipsychotics that are out there on the market. And, you know, you can see that there's a vast range of first episode dosages, you know, from one milligram, 1.5 milligram, all the way up to 400 milligrams. So there really is a market for, for antipsychotics out there. Um, the way that this is separated out, you've got your FGAs, which is your first generation. Uh, that's your older ones, you know, the first ones that were invented. Don't tend to see so much of them used anymore. Uh, the side effects are pretty bad. Um, they're just kind of, you know, the second gener generation antipsychotics are felt to be a little bit better, a little bit more tolerated by people, less of a side effect profile, but they're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Now, we call the side effects of first generation antipsychotics EPSEs, and that's extra pyramidal side effects. Um, that refers to an area of, of the brain uh, where these side effects kind of manifest. <coughs> and if you've got any kind of like uh, familiarity with Parkinson's, you may well recognize some of these symptoms um, as symptoms of Parkinson's. So dystonia, muscle spasm, that kind of tremor, that restlessness. Um, people with schizophrenia have, make, have this symptom called tardive dyskinesia, which is almost quite funny facial expressions, lolling their tongue about. And if you think about it, Parkinson's, very much a disorder of having too little dopamine. That's why movement gets quite erratic. That's why people present with that tremor. So having too much antipsychotic or too strong a dose will make someone present as if they've got Parkinson's. So how we manage that is we look at dose reduction. There's a drug called procyclidin, uh, which is quite good for managing some of these side effects. Um, but ideally, if someone's really quite crippled with EPSEs, what we would want to do is switch them to a second generation antipsychotic uh, because they tend to be a little bit more tolerated. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even the SGAs have side effects, very prominent sexual side effects again, drowsiness, weight gain. You know, some of these drugs are actually directly responsible for people developing diabetes um, at a metabolic level. But because it makes you so drowsy, it can make you feel a bit kind of unmotivated. We know that people with mental health problems are more likely to perhaps live in poverty, not have access to good food. So if you then stick on a medication that's slowing someone right down, that's also going to exacerbate their risks of, you know, physical health problems, cardiovascular problems. Um, I think my next seminar is actually on the importance of physical health monitoring. So again, we'll unpick some of that. Um, <clears throat> one of the kind of most compelling pieces of research that we know about uh, when it comes to antipsychotics is the patient choice and patient involvement in their care plan is the one thing that correlates with kind of best outcome. So if you're working with someone, if they are involved in their choice of medication, um, if they are involved in their choice of therapy, you know, working with their community mental health nurse, they are going to have far better outcomes than someone who feels that we are kind of forcing a drug on them. Um, so antipsychotics, you might also encounter them used in rapid tranquilization. Um, acute hospital settings, you know, if someone's acutely psychotic, very distressed, if they're immediate risk to themselves or others, you may well have seen haloperidol or olanzapine used in that setting. Now, these are the same drugs that are formulated. They're just formulated differently depending on their use. Um, antipsychotics also come in a depot preparation. You know, people with psychosis, schizophrenia, they can be quite chaotic at times. So for a lot of people, it actually suits them to have an injection that works over two to four weeks than it is to manage multiple daily tablets. Um, so if you take a lanzapine, for example, you know, if we contrast depot versus rapid trank uh, for a depot medication, the dose will be much larger. So you're talking about 150 milligrams, which will last you two to four weeks. 
compared to 10 milligrams, five to 10 milligrams in rapid tranquilization. And the difference is the amount of oil that they put in the solution. So more oil in the depot means that it takes longer to break down in the body. Whereas for obvious reasons, you need your rapid trank to act quickly. You know, if you've got an emergency setting where you need to kind of restrain, control someone's aggressive behavior, we can't have that taking two to four weeks to work, you know, for obvious reasons. I'm not going to linger too much on this slide uh, because we do unpick it in the next seminar. Uh, but there's a whole load of shared care arrangements um, that come along with the monitoring of antipsychotics. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think people grasp just how powerful, how impactful these drugs are on the human body. You know, all of the things that you can see on the screen in front, front of you can be directly impacted by antipsychotics. And that's why physical health monitoring um, of this patient group is so, so important. But we will look at that in the next seminar. Uh, we're going to just briefly talk about mood stabilizers, not in a huge amount of detail, uh, because there are kind of, I guess, they're the, the rarer kind of drugs in uh, psychiatry, you know, bipolar is kind of one of the more rarer conditions. It's known as a severe and enduring mental illness, you know, much less common than depression, for example. Uh, so the main drug that we use to treat that is lithium, uh, but we also use sodium valproate, carbamazepine, uh, which you might also see in the treatment of epilepsy. Uh, now there's a big patient safety drive at the moment. A lot of these drugs are known to cause birth defects. Um, so there's really, um, you know, people, women that are on it, women of a childbearing age, uh, really need to be on a birth control plan as well, uh, just because the risk to the fetus, if that lady were to become pregnant, would be quite significant. Um, so this can be quite difficult for, for women to manage. Um, I think I've also got a, a seminar coming up on perinatal mental health. So we're going to be looking at some of the issues that pregnant people uh, with mental health issues face, both in the, the, the period running up to birth and sort of antenatally as well. Now, this looks very complicated, um, but it's quite a handy way of visualizing uh, mood disorders. Uh, so bipolar means two poles. Um, you know, I'm not going to unpick bipolar in, in great detail here, but I think the main takeaway from that is that it swings between severe depression and mania. I think a misconception about bipolar is that that will happen within a space of hours or days, but in reality, people kind of sit at the poles for weeks or even months before going into the next one. And the point of a mood stabilizer is we really want to kind of limit the range of that mood, that expansive mood, and try and get it into a more normal range. For a lot of people, it might well be getting it from severe to moderate or from manic to hypermanic. And the aim for, for everyone, I guess, you know, whether it's bipolar or unipolar, is getting them into that kind of normal mood range. Uh, lithium, you know, we'll unpick this as well in the physical health monitoring, naturally occurring, um, but a very, very narrow therapeutic range. Like a lot of drugs, it can be toxic very, very quickly um, and it can build up in the body very quickly as well. I'm going to talk very briefly about benzodiazepines. You probably come across these, uh, diazepam, valium, lorazepam, temazepam, clonazepam. If it ends in a pam, it's probably a uh, benzo. Um, kind of probably inappropriately prescribed for a lot of people. Really, they should only be used for short term and very severe disabling anxiety. But we do see it prescribed for people that are maybe more mild to moderate and it's prescribed longer term. They're really, really addictive. So really, if you start a, a benzodiazepine, you want to have an end date on that to manage expectations as well. Ideally, what you would do for someone that's very, very anxious, you'd maybe give them a short dose at the same time that you start an SSRI. Um, but really, you want to avoid prescribing this drug class if you can, uh, because they aren't a treatment. It's more about symptom relief. Um, and patients can build that tolerance very, very quickly. Um, and a lot of these drugs as well have a street value. Uh, they commonly go missing from drug carts and hospitals um, because I guess, you know, nursing, nursing staff, medics as well, um, healthcare staff, 
perhaps more prone to being stressed out, maybe self-medicating, access to these drugs. Um, so it's very much a problem for, for staff self-medicating as well. What we're seeing more and more in addiction services is the use of imported Xanax. Uh, so that's just a very strong benzo. We don't prescribe it here, but people can get hold of it in the same way that they can get hold of cocaine, etc. Um, and these are very similar to the Z drugs for sleep, Zopaclone, Zolpidem, etc. Golden rule with them is, you know, I would give three, four nights maximum, really, is to reboot the sleep pattern, not as a substitute for kind of sleep hygiene, etc. Um, I just wanted to end, as we come to the end of this, you know, a few notes about overdose. Because people with mental health problems are perhaps at more risk of harming themselves, wanting to kill themselves, we do see psychiatric drugs used in overdose quite commonly. Um, this is some signs that you want to look out for, confusion, drowsiness, altered consciousness, anything like that, you know, especially if there's a risk history, uh, should be a kind of red flag for suspected overdose. Your local trust will have various uh, policies in place for managing paracetamol overdose. The absolute golden rule for that is the quicker, the better. The quicker we provide that antidote, the better the outcome. Um, it's kind of thought that if you can give that antidote within eight hours, the person's going to survive, regardless of the amount that they've taken. That can get tricky if it's been a staggered overdose, but it really is a small window of opportunity. You know, I've seen a woman die uh, or need sort of uh, liver transplants after 10 paracetamol because she's waited too long to get that help. Whereas I've seen people survive 200 plus tablets because they've been able to get that antidote, the NAC, the N acetyl. Uh, so I forgot the name. NAC, you can look it up. Um, so, yeah, just in summary, many types of antidepressant, but SSI, SSRIs are certainly the most common. They typically work on serotonin, increasing the amount that's available. Antipsychotics work by reducing dopamine in the brain, but that is also why we have such severe side effects from that. Uh, mood stabilizers are used in bipolar, but need really, really close monitoring. And with benzos, always prescribe kind of uh, conservatively. There's a huge potential for addiction there, and it's not a treatment uh, or a cure. It's really for short-term use only. Uh, I guess, regardless of your role, be mindful of people's mental health history. Could that be a physical health problem manifesting as a mental health issue? Um, and think about, you know, recreational drug use, over-the-counter drug use. You know, you might be that trusted clinician that can get that information and share that, you know, to, to, to minimise that risk, minimise that burden. Uh, for anyone that missed it, I have done a seminar in the past. I'm sure you can access through uh, the CPDME on risk on mental state examination.